Welcome to part two of Talisman Saber's 3D printed terrain Kickstarter preview. As I was editing the first video, I realized how long it was gonna be, so decided to separate this out into two different videos. This video is the tutorial of how I magnetize how I paint all of the tiles as well as pour resin into the traps. Check out the descriptions below for links to all the products that I mentioned as well as the list of paints that I am using. So here are the magnets that I would suggest is these three millimeter diameter by three millimeter thickness. Uh, these cylinder magnets, I have used these 3 by 2s which are a little bit cheaper, but I like the strength of the 3 by 3s a little bit more. So you can use either ones, but um, I would, if you don't have any, I would suggest getting the 3 by 3s And what I do is I have another magnet on this end, and that just keeps me uh, straight with the polarity of the magnets as I put them in so that they're consistent and the reason why they need to be consistent is because when you're stacking them on the riser you need these ones to be able to clip on top and if it's the wrong polarity it obviously won't stick right so that's why you need to keep track of polarity and with this one obviously you need to keep track because this is going to be the opposite polarity of the top so you need to flip this stack over what i do is i do all the bottoms first and then i move this marker piece over here and I take it from the other end when i do the tops so that's how i keep track of polarity and then i write t on here for top um, i did when i created these um, cylinders i did put top inside the actual stl file so that you can keep track of that. And then um, I just use this nail set that I found. I already had it. And the reason why it's good, there might be other tools. If you know of them, go ahead and put them in the comments below. But I just slide one of these on here like this. And it holds it really nicely because this is made out of steel. And then I grab this guy and Depending on your printer settings and how much the printer is actually squashing down, you can just push it in there really hard, but as you can see here, there's still some sticking out. So what I do is I just place this nail set on here and just tap it with a hammer until it is flush like that. And that's pretty much how it works. Now there are some pieces that mess up, like here. And what I use is this little uh, hand drill. Again, there's links for all this in the descriptions below. And I have to clear out this initial layer like this. I don't want to drill too far in because sometimes you make it too loose. And if you do end up being too loose or the hole is a little bit too big, just squeeze a little bit of super glue right in the hole and that will actually hold it in place but hopefully most of the time um, there's enough um, pressure just to hold it in place like this. So after I drill out the hole just a little bit, do the same thing, grab and just push it in there. And then I just test it to make sure it's not too loose by sticking it on here and make sure it isn't pulled out. And that's basically how it works, pretty easy. And then what I did was, and this is optional because this is actually pretty pricey. Um, I went to Office Max and had a poster made up. And this cost me uh, $42. If I didn't go with a self-adhesive poster, it would have been about six or seven dollars cheaper. But I went ahead and decided to get the self-adhesive since I am sticking this onto here. And this is really high quality linen. It's not shiny at all. And because it's meant to be a poster outdoors, it's uh, pretty durable and it's not going to scratch at all. So it is a little bit on the pricey side and this is purely optional. But there's an advantage to putting this hex onto here. And I'll show you that in a little bit. But you gotta be careful in peeling this off and sticking it to the piece of metal. Make 
make sure you're not getting any air bubbles while you're doing this. And as you can see here, I can reposition it if I need to. So anything that's going to be brown, I am spray painting in this camouflage two times ultra cover. It's the dark brown. Now Krylon also comes out with the camouflage and the reason why I like the camouflage line is because it's really matte, not at all glossy. So um, I don't even know what the name of this stuff is, but just a, if you don't have this, a soup, the darkest brown that you can get is what you want. And not all this is Gloomhaven stuff. This over here is printable scenery Shadow Fay um, stuff, but it's all gonna be wood. So I'm spray painting that as well. But just what I do is I do a light coat from one side and then I just switch sides and then do the other side as well. And it's hard to tell because it is, um, this is spraying on black, but um, I'll do first this side and then switch over, do it, come at it from all four sides. And that's basically what I'm doing. And then once you're done, just um, flip over some of these that you have to spray on the other side. Otherwise you're finished. Now that the brown is done, we're gonna do all of the gray and I'm using Rustolium 2 Times Ultra Cover Premium Ultra Matte. And this is the slate color. So any dark gray will work and we're gonna do both the cave as well as all of the dungeon uh, tiles as well as traps with this color. So the, for the floor of the ice caverns, I am using Williamsburg Blue. My general philosophy is that the floor should be a different color than the walls just to distinguish it a little bit. You don't have to do that, but in general, I feel like the um, differentiation between the floor and the walls uh, is important just because it lets it stand out. And I do, um, just use a stiff horsehair brush just to do the dry brushing. You know what, after taking a look at these walls, I think I'm going to make these a little bit brighter. So obviously you guys just do this all in one step where you're putting on a more even coat of the Williamsburg Blue. And it's still sort of dry brushed on and so you're gonna still have some gray poking through and that's fine make sure to also get the edges of all of the bases here and then once you do that go ahead and do the rocks any of the terrain and you want this to go in pretty far. Still, you're dry brushing, so you're leaving some of the gray, especially close to the ground. You wanna keep it gray, but this is gonna be sort of the base color, and the lighter colors are gonna go on top of this. So this is how the colors tie in together. And so, see how I'm pushing the brush into these crevices. Even though I'm keeping a lot of it gray, I do want this um, blue, this darker blue gray to go in deeper. And then when I dry brush with the other ones, I want that to be lighter. 
uh, where I'm not pushing it in as far into these cracks and crevices. But again, there's still some gray showing through and that's fine, that's what, sort of what you want. But this will just help tie in all of the cavern pieces to one another, like that. Next, we are grabbing Sea Breeze. And you do sort of want a fade so that, see how there's a dark line down here at the bottom? And go ahead and use a lot of this because we're still gonna do another coat, a final lighter coat on top of this. So you don't want to cover as much as you did with the blue-gray, but you're still putting on a lot here. So there's still some of the gray showing through, which is fine. That just provides some shading. And then once you get to the top, put a lot on the top. Because this is where it's going to be the lightest due to the light shining down on it. So you want the most color to be on top. And that's pretty much what you're aiming for. Now I'm going to just grab these and just very lightly put just a little bit of highlighting. And you want your brush to be pretty dry here. So it's just a very light dry brush. And just as a way of comparison See, it's just barely anything, but it just puts in just enough color into there so that it ties into the walls a little bit better. Go ahead and do our final coat on the walls with sea glass. And if you don't have any, you can just add some white to the sea breeze just to make a lighter version. And this, because it's the final coat, you don't want a lot of this on your brush and you want your brush to be super dry. And so rub it across a paper towel if you need to, but go ahead and grab your walls again. And you're basically only highlighting, again, starting from the top and it's probably hard to see in the video, but I am lightening it up a little bit. And so this is the final coat, and so you don't have to put a ton on. But this is only going on the walls, not on the floors. So do that with all of your walls. Now we want to take some burnt umber from Apple Barrel or any dark brown. And I'm going to just grab my sable brush and we are going to paint any bones this dark brown. And this is important because we want to differentiate the color from all of the, even the dark gray, because we want the bones to be a warmer color so that there's contrast here. And then we're gonna go over this with some beige. You're also gonna do these dragon bones and also these posts for the bridge if you have the bridge. Go ahead and grab some fawn or actually you can use white and mix it in with the dark brown and what you want to do is get a beige. So if, if you grab some of this and mix it with this, just to get a little bit darker color. And then you want to um, go ahead and put it on the bones and leave some of the dark brown for the recesses, like that. And then now just grab directly 
from here. And then just do the top part. So that you got sort of that fade going. I'm gonna grab some true blue. That's the color I'm going to make these crystals. You can pick whatever color you want. I thought about doing purple, but just decided to do blue. And just color all of this in. So while we're waiting for this blue to dry, let me go ahead and show you how to put snow effects onto these walls. So I am using golden light molding paste. I watched Miniac's video where he tested a bunch of different materials and I like this effect the best. Links in the descriptions below. I bought this for about $15 and this is going to be plenty. And it really goes on similar to the consistency of whipped frosting. And so just grab some. I'm using a popsicle stick, but you can use the end of a plastic spoon or something like that. And basically you're going to apply it on top because that's most likely where snow will accumulate. And just put some on where you think snow would catch. And you can sort of drag it down. And then it would also catch here on the edges as well. So basically anywhere, you know, on these flat spots, you can put quite a bit on there. And because it sort of goes on like frosting, you're gonna get these sort of lifted parts like this. Don't worry too much about that right now because there's a way to flatten them later. So I'm just gonna apply some you know, where I think it should go. And if you do sort of a dragging motion sort of going down like this, it will catch on sort of these ledges and lips and so this this is probably enough and I'm gonna set this set it aside and it takes I don't know a couple hours to dry and then for the floor tiles uh, I'm just gonna grab a third of my cave floor tiles and just randomly put some on now I don't want to make it too thick because I don't want the miniatures to wobble but I'm going to favor putting it on sort of like in patches like this and make it splotchy and I'm putting it near the cracks. Like so. And again, see how because it's sticky when you pull the tool away, it creates a little raised thing like frosting. But again, that's okay because we're going to come back after it dries a little bit to flatten it out. And then you can even tell here on these pieces, I put some on the skeleton. And this piece as well, I put some along here. I probably put a little bit more here that so after about 20 minutes or so go ahead and come back and see all the spiky parts to this you just want to smooth it out by gently tapping on the edges of it and that will push down any spikes left from 
applying this. So just very gently round out these tops. And it's still gonna be relatively wet. Just smooth it out that way. You don't have to go overboard, just getting rid of any of those spikes that is unnatural because snow doesn't function that way. Just push it all down like so. And that's, that's pretty much it. Then you can let it dry the rest of the way. So now that this is all dry, I'm gonna go ahead and mix some white. Or if you have lighter blue, you can just grab that as well. But just mix some white into the blue like this. And then going to do edging which is just following the edge of the crystals, like so. So now that you have that we're gonna actually add a little bit more white to the blue I'll make it pretty light and this time um, you're only gonna edge uh, some of it not all of it All right, that looks good. So for the floors and half of the doors and wooden pieces, I'm gonna use burnt sienna. And then for the other half of the wood, I am using milk chocolate. And typically because milk chocolate is so light, I usually have to do two coats of it. And I wanna get it in, still leaving the dark brown, but because I'm gonna do another coat after this one, I do want quite a bit of paint to get it in there. Whereas the um, burnt sienna, I only had to do one coat of that and got some pretty good coverage. This is about as much as you want. And then do all the rest of the wood. Uh, I'm choosing to do this piece as well as this tree. I did these trees in burnt sienna just to provide some kind of variation and then I'm also going to do the bridge with burnt sienna or I'm sorry with um, milk chocolate. See how by dry brushing I'm keeping the dark brown in the crevices but notice the difference the color difference between these two. So this is more reddish like a cherry 
and then this is uh, more tannish uh, true brown. All right, so look at this massive pile of wood coloring that I have done. Again, this is not a part of Gloomhaven set. This is from printable scenery, so ignore this stuff, but I'm using the same, same color scheme. Now I'm gonna, now that I've done all of the milk chocolate, I'm gonna go back and do a second coat just because um, it's fairly dark as you can see here. So just keep your brush going and you can cycle through all of the pieces, but you will actually notice um, a lot of brightening up that happens with that second coat. Just because that dark brown underneath is so dark that it mutes this color. So I'm not doing the whole thing, just doing sort of the top part that I want to be brighter. I'll show you this floor from the bridge, which I'm doing a significantly lighter brown than I did with the floor, the wooden floor. But see how by adding a second coat, how much more brown and lighter it becomes. And that, that's why you want a second coat. So let me compare that, these two. What I'm gonna do is grab my honey brown and straight out of the bottle is a little bit too light for me. So I'm actually gonna mix it with the milk brown just to not have it be quite as light. So just mix it up like this. And because this is just highlighting, uh, you don't need as much of it on your brush. And you're sort of just highlighting some spots. And because the milk brown looks pretty good on its own. You don't have to do a lot of this you're, and you're not going over everything. Just some spots to highlight. So the effect is subtle but I think looks good. So you want to do that with all of your wood pieces um, with the exception of the bridge. So here you can see the tree, the barks of the tree lighten up a little bit where I apply this just on the top portions just to make it a little bit lighter. So with the bridge pieces I'm just using the pure honey brown without mixing it at all because I want the bridge to look lighter. So I'm not pushing it in as much as I did the original base layer of milk chocolate, but I'm putting on more than I was when I was highlighting some of the other pieces. So this color is definitely different than some of the other wooden pieces, you know, like this. So let's see how much lighter this is than this. So I'm gonna go ahead and do the rope and I'm using burnt sienna. This is the same color that I used for the wooden floors. And I don't want to cover up the dark brown prime coat that I put underneath here because that provides the appropriate shading. So really, I'm only painting the raised edges. Again, I'm leaving the dark undercoating, dark brown unpainted, just so that it provides that shading and distinguishes the rope. All right, so this looks pretty good, but if you wanna have a little bit of extra highlighting, go ahead and grab some burnt orange. And here you are just touching up the very high spots with this. And it's just an extra level of brightness. 
All right, take a look at that. That bridge looks pretty awesome. So I think it turned out looking pretty good. And I did clip it because I'm assuming it's going to be spanning some space. So that's why it's all clipped together. So this is in case you print these out like I did or Talisman Saber decides to have one of their stretch goals be these Tudor style walls, which I'm really hoping. So go ahead and grab some fawn or any light beige color. And I would not suggest using white because white is just way too bright. So having something that's a little bit off-white, and if you don't have anything that is off-white, just take your white and mix a little bit of brown into it so that you get a nice beige color. And as you can see here, even though this is off-white, it is pretty bright on these pieces. So see, see how nice that looks? And you don't have to worry about going all the way up to the edge of the wood. All right, now we're gonna go ahead and do the earth tiles. What we're gonna do is just grab some Mississippi mud or this kind of color. These are all a lot warmer than this color. So we're gonna use this as the mud. So let's go ahead and grab this piece that is completely made of mud. I think I have a little bit too much on here. And then just paint it in like this. And don't forget the sides. And then these pieces, um, you can go ahead, even though it has grass on there, you can go ahead and do the entire thing because we're gonna come back with the green. And in order to get the mud parts, you have to sort of get the green, uh, the grass parts as well. So in these mixed parts, don't worry about it. Just hit it like that. Should be all right. Go ahead and grab some fawn for some highlighting. really light with it actually like that now we're gonna go ahead and grab some forest green and I'm gonna use a smaller brush for this because I'm gonna to have to be more precise on where I apply it really sort of jam it in there because you want to go ahead and just cover up most of the brown underneath. Now we're going to grab some festive green and then just go lightly over the high parts of the grass. And you can be splotchy with this, you don't have to do everything evenly and that gives you just a little bit more highlighting with the color. Some alternative green colors you can use is avocado with a highlight of celery green. And I'm gonna go ahead and do that for this little bush here so that it just differentiates it from here. I could also do it for the trees too if you want. I'll probably do the highlight actually in celery green since I already put down the other green here. The celery green by itself was a little bit too bright, so I just mixed it with the avocado. And this gives it a little bit more of an olive shade to it, so just highlighting the edges of the leaves here. And that's enough to differentiate it from the grass tiles. It's a different kind of green. We're going to go back to our doors and use black.
Now we're grabbing zinc, which is a dark gray, and it actually isn't quite dark enough. So I am going to mix it with some black just to darken it up a little. Because what the color we're trying to match is the gray, the dark gray spray paint that we primed all of the stone items with. So it has to be about this color of gray. And we're going to do the door frames all this color. And then also you want to do all of the stones here, here, don't forget there are stones here at the base of the tree. And you can leave some brown on there, that's fine. Isn't the end of the world if this dark brown is showing through. Now I'm gonna grab some slate gray and mix it with the zinc because I want a tone that's in between these two. So almost 50-50, because zinc is too dark and slate gray is too light. So that's, that's what we're looking for there. And you're going to go ahead and just do a light. I wouldn't say this is dry brushing because my brush isn't dry because I want more to go on there than what normal dry brushing will do. But as long as you're just creating and highlighting the texture, you're gonna be good. The wood, these roots we're gonna have to go back and do with planning on using a green to do that. All right, now we're gonna tackle the dungeon and what I am doing is grabbing the zinc and slate gray and I'm gonna mix this up about half-half and that's gonna be base coating all of the dungeon pieces except for the floors. I want the floors to be darker than the walls, so I'll show you that that's gonna be different. So basically we're gonna cover all of the rocks from the dungeon set first with this mixture. So I'm gonna go ahead and just, again, I'm using my broad stiff brush and gonna mix both of these together about half-half like I said is going to be going on fairly thickly. And, but you wanna maintain um, the dark gray underneath to be sort of the lining of uh, each of the bricks. So just be careful. I do have quite a bit of paint on my brush right now. So I have to be careful not to over paint. And then, like I did with some of the other sets, I do um, like to fade it down towards the bottom. But basically, this is a pretty easy step because you are indiscriminately pretty much getting this gray all over. So go ahead and do that for all the pieces again. I'll show you in a little bit what I do with the floors, but just cover the entire thing like this. And uh, I rub both directions, not just up and down, but left to right, where I'm catching all of the stones. And you wanna make sure that your brush is actually pretty dry because we want this to stay predominantly this um, dark gray color. So this is super light. I am putting this on here very, very lightly. I definitely do not wanna have any streaks. And that is pretty much it. So I'm catching the edges, a little bit of the gray is going on the surface, 
but that is the extent that I want to put uh, this dry brushing onto here. So I want it to be much dar darker as a floor than the walls. And then make sure you do the walls uh, from the doors, all of the doors, and that's why we painted this with the dark gray so that we can do all these walls as well. All right, so now we're gonna do some spot painting where we're gonna paint individual stones. And the primary colors that I'm gonna use is Honey Brown and Burnt Sienna. These are colors that we used on the wood pieces. And pretty easy process where we're just going to randomly grab a couple stones and we can just start up here in this corner. And we just color in whichever ones we want. And I don't think you need a ton of these colored. Maybe we want to do this one here where it wraps all the way around. Now we're grabbing the honey brown, just spacing it out. Randomly picking some out here. And I know it looks cartoony right now because it is so bright, but do not worry. We're gonna pull it all together. All right, so now that this is dry, I am going to grab my fawn, which is an off-white beige color. And see how this is gray. And at this point, you can actually use the slate gray and um, highlight, do exactly what I'm gonna do with the fawn, but do it with the lighter gray. And that will keep your pieces gray, but I wanted to try out something different and instead use fawn and make it look a little bit less gray. And you don't need a lot of paint on your brush to do this, but just sort of drag it down. And what I'm hoping to do is actually make this look a little bit less gray and be more on the browner side of things. So by using a beige highlight rather than a gray highlight, I think I can achieve that look. And also by doing this coat, you will mellow out these spotted colors and it ties in the whole piece a little bit better when you do this final coat of dry brushing. But the gray is still showing through. So you're not, this is not a heavy coat, but just something that you want to highlight the piece. I think that's hard to tell. Let me turn off this overhead light and maybe the true color. Yeah, you can see the true colors a little bit better this way. So see how it's not so gray anymore. So this is the undercoat before spotting and it gives it more of a tan kind of color to it even though all of the undertones are gray. So I like this effect on these pieces and pretty much um, you're done once you do this. But it's up to you. You can do different colors for these spots. Some people even use um, olive green or something like that. Um, or you can even mix up some colors just to have variation. But this I think is a good compromise between speed of being able to um, get this done quickly and at the same time providing enough variety to each of these pieces. I'm grabbing some silver and this is metallic gunmetal gray by Folk Art. I do have a lighter silver here. But I'm going to go ahead and try this first, um, and if it's too dark, I'll go with a lighter one. You're just sort of lightly brushing on the silver, like so. So that it looks like that. I think, I think that's good enough. I don't think I'm going to go with the lighter silver, but let's try out the grates here is fine. 
And it is a little bit harder, I think, because I didn't put black down um, to see the silver. But I think that looks fine. Um, otherwise, you can put the lighter silver on there to make it stand out more. And then I think the final piece that requires silver is this wall because there's grading on here. And you can put rust effects by using browns and reds onto here if you want to splotch it on there, but I think this is fine. So that looks good. All right, we're close to the end here and we're gonna go ahead and do the traps for these spike traps. All I did was do a dry brush of gray, the same gray over the floor tiles. And then I did the burnt sienna on the spikes. And then on top of that, I just put some silver on there. And I think I'm pretty much done with these. I don't think I'm gonna do anything else. But with these guys, uh, I'm going to go ahead and put on some festive green uh, on the internal side here because I'm going to go ahead and pour some Envirotex light into these. But I find that if you color the bottoms close to what you want the um, liquid to be, it just enhances it. So let me go ahead and throw some of this on there. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna directly just drip some paint in here and then spread it around with my brush. I'm not getting it completely, just in general because the when we pour in the resin, that's gonna take care of some of the coloring. And now I'm gonna grab some lime green. All you have to do is take your um, other green and add a little bit of uh, yellow and white to it to lighten it up. And just gonna dry brush the ground here with it. That just makes the texture pop out a little bit more. Actually, before we do that, we gotta do the bones, and I'm gonna use milk chocolate as a base, and then fawn on top of that. I'm adding some white to this as well, just to make it stand out a little bit more. So as you can see here, you don't have to put any resin in here because if you paint it up like this, it actually looks pretty good. So this next step is purely optional. And so again, this is if you want the wow factor to go up that much more. The stuff that I use is Envir Envirotex Light Pour On. And I, I think you can buy this pretty much at Hobby Lobby or at Michael's. Um, but I'll provide links in the descriptions below for Amazon. And this is a two-part epoxy. It's a one-to-one -one ratio. And basically how I mix it up is I grab two small little cups and I use a little Sharpie just to mark off the same spot 
let me see, let's go a little bit less because that's a massive amount. And we only need a little bit. So that's approximately the same mark. And then I'm just gonna pour part A in one and part B in the other. And as you can see here, my hardener is really yellow because I've had this for a long time. When you buy it, it'll be all clear. I don't care because I'm adding coloring to this. Um, and even if you want it to be clear, you don't really notice this yellowing in the final product. So I wouldn't worry too much about it if, it's super, if yours is yellow as well. It's not really going to affect things. But just pour it in here until it gets to the line. Now with my popsicle stick, I'm gonna grab a little bit of that lime green that I made earlier. And you don't need a lot. I mean, just a little bit. If you put too much, you make the entire thing too cloudy. And so this is about as much as I want. And then I'm gonna start pouring this into the other cup. And in other situations, I have used food coloring. You can use inks or washes. Contrast colors would work well. And the advantage of that is you're not going to create an opaque solution when you use inks or contrast colors. It'll be more clear uh, or with food coloring. And you don't need a lot. So just be careful with the amount that you put in there. So now stir this up and you want to avoid getting air bubbles in here. And like I mentioned, this is actually a ton more than what we need, but sometimes it just makes it easier to mix up. And it doesn't look like it's turning very green. So I might add a little bit more color. There, now, now I'm getting that green tint. Let's make sure that it's remaining mostly clear rather than turning too opaque. So now that I've mixed it in this cup, I'm gonna mix back into this original cup over here. And see how there are air bubbles in there? I'm just going to pour in like this. Just scrape the sides and then I'm going to mix this up. I'm going to add just a little bit more color because it doesn't seem noticeable yet. So now we're going to go ahead and pour. And just be careful. I'm avoiding getting it on top of the skeleton's head. and see how viscous it is. So like I mentioned before, you don't need a ton of this stuff. And I noticed on Talisman's website that they poured it all the way up to the top, but I'm not going to do that. I'm just gonna put in enough so that it covers all the pieces. Now here, on this side with the bubbles, I actually am pouring it on top because I want the bubbles to be shiny. And what will happen is because this stuff will um, takes a long time to dry. I'm going to spread this around to make sure that it's covering all of the tops of the bubbles because I want the bubbles to be shiny and look wet. And right now you'll, you'll notice that I haven't poured any here in the back, but that's okay because this stuff will slowly seep around until it is it fills in the back over here because I don't wanna risk pouring it on top of this wheel because I don't want that to look wet or glossy fruit fly flying around my poison pits right now, which I guess is thematically consistent. So like I mentioned before, I have barely used any of this. 
see how you can still see the bottom and that's why I bother to paint the bottom is because the way that I mix my resin is I don't make it so that it's completely opaque and you can see some of the details at the bottom which which I like so that's why I um, end up painting the bottom so once I've poured everything in I do cover it up and you can use a bowl or I'm just using a box here. The reason is because it takes so long to dry 24 hours, you don't want lint to settle on top and get uh, and mar the surface. So that's why you want to cover it up and just leave it alone. I know you'll be super tempted to touch it or something like that. Do not do that. Just give it 24 hours and don't mess with it at all. Hopefully this video is helpful for you as you are embarking on your journey of creating your frost haven or gloom haven terrain board. If so, please like and subscribe. Again, check out my Patreon page to see what the GGGG is. Happy hobbying, happy gaming. We'll see you next time.